Wonderful to see everybody here. New faces, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you. And thank you for the soundboard. Did Dale get that fixed? Yep. Thank it's you, thank good. you, Dale. Yeah, Don't know if he's... There he is, okay. <laughs> good, good. Spread it around, thank you. Appreciate it. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Philippians 1, 1 through 8. Started the book of Philippians, the letter of Philippians last week with an introduction. Talked about how the theme of the letter is joy, rejoicing, thanksgiving, in the midst of suffering, right? Paul is in prison while he writes this, but he still sings. I noticed in one of the songs we just sang, Sing, O oh, Sing through the raging storm. We're able to do that because, as we said last week, even though joy is the theme and rejoicing is the theme and thanksgiving is the theme, Christ is more so. Rejoicing is, what, 19, 20 times uh, in joy and words like that through, through the letter, but Christ, Jesus, is over 50 times stated in the book of Philippians, so we're able to rejoice because of Him. So this morning we're looking at verses 1 through 8. Please have a Bible in front of you. If you don't have one, there should be one there in the pocket of the pew in front of you. Philippians 1, 1 through 8. Let's read that and then we'll open in prayer and begin to dissect it. Philippians 1, beginning at verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of, it, of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the ability to gather together and to sing the songs that we sang to Listen to the instruction and teaching that we received in Sunday school. We thank you, Father, for everyone who has worked a part, who's played a part, who's put their, their back into it and worked hard developing lessons and singing the songs and helping us to sing them. Father, we thank you for each one, uh, each one that has been expressing their gifts. And we also thank you, Father, that we have something to sing about and something to study. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for everything that you have done for us, Father, through Christ. We thank you for blessing the body with gifts so that we can bless one another. Father, as we begin to look into this precious letter, I pray that you help each one of us to, to really do our work in looking and thinking and studying and trying to understand exactly what you're saying here. I pray, Father, that you'll open our eyes. The Spirit will guide us and instruct us and teach us. We thank you for these precious truths we're going to see today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Like I said, last week we introduced this letter to the Philippians by looking back in the book of Acts at the historical account when Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke walked into Philippi with the gospel. We looked at the different people who came to know the Lord through that and how the church was established. And I thought as I'm looking at this today, I thought, how did Paul remember the Philippians? Because he talks about remembering them. How does he remember those people? He could have remembered it this way. And it as I said last week, we can have a couple different mindsets when we look at situations, can't we? We can look at them and we can see the circumstances, the things that get in our way, or we can follow after Christ and, and understand that He is guiding us and He is leading us and, and, that, and that we are His servants. Two different ways of looking at things. 
They could have looked at, the, looked at it this way. All I remember is closed doors, having to change our plans again and again, having to go way out of our way to Philippi instead of going east where we wanted to go. When we got there, there was no synagogue, so we had to go down by the river, and there was just a, few, a handful of women meeting there. Oh, and that demon-possessed girl that followed us around, what a pain. <laughs> Always dogging our tracks, broadcasting who we were. We did not want to be associated with that. And of course, that created quite the stir. Her two owners, who made money off of her demon possession, hauled us into court, and we won't speak of being caned. We were beaten with rods by the magistrates, then thrown in prison, feet in the stocks. But we got even, because they didn't know we were Roman citizens. And when they found out, boy, were they scared. <laughs> That's one way they could have looked at it. That's one way Paul could have remembered things. But no, we see right off, as we look in here at verses 3 and 4, Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I see, there were difficult trying times, weren't there? There were difficult people. But Paul was not living for himself. Paul was not setting out his own itinerary, having his own plans. No, Paul was living for something more. He wasn't just living for a, a simple, happy, uncomplicated life. And if you think about it, that's what a lot of us are, are hoping for, and that's what we're, we're shooting for. Just, just let me be happy. Just let me experience some peace and some joy. But that's not what Paul was doing, as we're going to see as we look here at the, the beginning of this letter. He was on a mission to take the gospel of Christ, the good news of Christ to the Gentiles. He was living on purpose. He was living for the highest purpose. Through all of those difficulties that they experienced when they first went into Paul, to Philippi, Paul could see that God was at work. He was at work. That God had started a very good work there in Philippi. Now this, this is a more accurate telling of how Paul probably remembered the Philippians. Well, first, there was a very definite guidance from the Holy Spirit that we should go to Philippi. In retrospect, those closed doors to the east were such a blessing because what we found at Philippi was first, a faithful band of God-fearing women who met at the river for worship, and God opened the eyes of one of those ladies, Lydia, the first believer in Philippi. She had a business mind. She was successful. She was so hospitable. She, she opened up her house to us and to the church. Her life was transformed. She became a new creation. And that's exactly what happened to the young girl possessed. God set her free. What a blessing. We, we came into contact with her. And the jailer, so cruel and thoughtless at first, it's amazing how thoroughly God can change a person. That guy went from cruel abuser to hospitality nurse, hospitality chef, inviting us into his home. Paul would have shouted, transformed lives. Jesus Christ loved and worshipped among the Gentiles. Now Paul's, Paul's focus, as we said last week, is on Christ, isn't it? Again and again and again he is pointing to Christ, not his circumstances, not his comforts, but Christ and His goals and His aspirations. So, so now, now we're, we're 10 to 11 years later, and Paul is writing a letter back to this church in, in Philippi. He's been in contact with them several times. Um, uh, they've been in contact with him. They've partnered with him, as we're going to see here soon, partnered with him in the gospel and taking the gospel to the, to the world Th through finances, through prayer, through, uh, through actual sending people, that kind of thing. He sent Timothy to them to bless them. They sent Epaphroditus to him to bless him. In fact, that, that is the, the occasion that we have for this letter. The church in Philippi, has now grown. It has elders and deacons and, and more people in the pews, more people serving and, and working in the church. And they have some issues in the church. 
They have some things going on in the church, interpersonal problems with some people, some false teachings coming into the church. So the elders at the church send Epaphroditus with a letter saying, Paul, we need your help as an apostle. We need your help as one who's laying the foundation of the church. We, we need your help as one who, who was sent by Christ specifically to build the church, to, to lay the foundation for the church. So they send this letter by Epaphroditus, and now what we're looking at here is Paul's response. His letter back to them. And what we're going to see here in the first eight verses is just first simply a salutation, a greeting, a beginning. And then secondly, a, a prayerful, his prayerful, prayerful remembrance of them, his confident expectation of them, and his loving devotion to them. So first, look at the salutation quickly. The greeting. Verses 1 and 2. Different, if you'll notice, different form than we use. We usually put our, our name, the, the sender's name, at the end of the letter. But this was extremely, very common back in, in the day of the Bible. They, they have the, uh, the person who sent the letter written first, who it's going to, secondly, and then a greeting. So this letter is from Paul and Timothy. Paul the Apostle, real quick, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on who he is. Remember though, he was specifically appointed by the risen and glorified Christ to take the gospel to the Gentiles. If you remember, he was on the road to Damascus. Quite the conversion. Here we're talking about God transforming and changing lives. He went from persecutor of Christ, persecutor of the church, to a thankful, voluntary slave of Christ, right? And if you're not familiar with that account, that's in Acts 8 and 9. Very, very excellent reading. But do notice that in Philippians 1, verse 1, Paul refers to himself and Timothy as servants, if you notice. Servants of Jesus Christ. Your Bible probably has a little number by it, a, a note saying, and if you follow that note down to the bottom, or slaves, or bond servants. The word in the Greek is doulos, and it means a slave. It means a bottom-of-the-galley slave, someone who is, who is uh, not their own. They are owned. And this is key. This one little word is key to figuring out how Paul looks at life, how he can rejoice while, while he's in prison. If someone were to ask you, give me, give me one word that defines you, we would all sit there and think about it, and some people would say, well, I'm an entrepreneur. Other people would say, well, I'm, I'm an artist. Artist is big. Uh, a lot of people like to be artists now. Some people are. Um, athlete. We, 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 would, we would throw out that one thing that we hope labels us, what we aspire to be, what we want to be seen as, right? And Paul, Paul here says, I am definitely, before anything else, a slave a slave of Christ Jesus. One who has renounced all of his own rights and now lives for another. One who gives total allegiance to another person. The master's goals and aspirations are now mine. By the way, the same word is used of all Christians. We're all called slaves in Scripture, slaves of Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 19b and 20 says, You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Christ has purchased you. If you are a believer, if you've placed your faith in Christ, He has redeemed you. You are His now. What does 1 Peter 1, 18 say? Listen to this. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. You were ransomed. You were bought, purchased off of the slave block. And now you're His. And His perfect life and His perfect sacrifice is what ransomed you. I ran across something really interesting I, I want to share with you. James Boyce in his commentary, a very trustworthy preacher, theologian, says there were three ways you could become a slave in ancient days. Three different ways. One was by conquest. One, one nation taking over another. One people taking over another. Now those people are, are slaves. Another way is by birth. 
A child born to slaves is automatically a slave or by debt. A lot of parents, imagine this, sold their children off in order to satisfy a debt. Or they would sell themselves into slavery, and that doesn't happen now. That would be horrible, wouldn't it? Boyce pointed out, though, he said this. He said, we've all become slaves to sin in very similar ways. I thought this was a good explanation. Scripture tells us we were born into sin by Adam's sin, right? In Romans, we get the picture that through, through Adam's disobedience, we all fell. We're also s slaves to sin by conquest. It doesn't take us very long to figure out by the time we're two years old or somewhere around there that, that sin has power over us. That we are, we are doing what our sin makes us, asks us to do. It has mastery over us. Without Christ, we are powerless before sin, aren't we? And we're slaves by debt. Paul, Paul speaks of the wages of sin. Our account can only be paid by death. We're, we're in debt. And the only way we can pay that debt is by our death. But then Jesus stepped in. Again, look at the three ways that Jesus counters. Those three ways were, were made slaves to sin. He, was, he is spoken of in Romans as the second Adam, right? Adam came, and through him all people died. But Christ came, and through him there's life, Right? He defeated sin and death at the cross, and through Him and because of Him, the power and the penalty of sin have been conquered, right? Have been defeated. So I, th I thought that's, that's really neat. The three ways you could become a slave in, in ancient days, and three ways we can become a slave to sin. We are a slave to sin now. And Christ has met each one of those and turned them on their head. There, there's a lot we could say about that word servant, that word slave right there, but we'll, we'll move on. Now, Scripture doesn't just call us slaves. We're also, called, we're also called children of God, aren't we? We're called sons of God. We're called heirs, right? But slaves, that, that word speaks volume, volumes about who we are and how we should be living our lives. Look at one one there again. The letter is addressed to all the saints, it's not speaking of superior Christians, someone who's been recognized and given a superior status. Uh, the word speaks of being consecrated, being separated, being set apart. Again, that's speaking about every, every believer, all Christians. And he addresses it also to the leaders, to the overseers or the, the elders, those with leadership responsibility and the deacons, those who are recognized as serving in an official capacity. But look at verse 2, real quick, moving through this salutation. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace was the Grecian way to start a letter. It was the, the, the way the Greeks did it. But coming from Paul's pen, it, it takes on much more meaning. In fact, Paul changes it, and it's not the, the typical verb form of that word, but, it, but it's the noun form that he uses. And the word grace has a, a wide range of meanings, doesn't it? But, but, but all of them, all of those meanings are demonstrated in the fact that it speaks of God's free, undeserved favor. We read in Titus about the grace of God has appeared, training us. And, and, and that easily could be speaking about Christ Himself, but it could also be talking about the, the, the gift of enabling power from on high coming down to us. That's a, that's a gift. But it also could just be speaking about the, the free gift of, of, of salvation through faith alone, right? By grace alone, by undeserved favor. All of those definitions that are uniquely different, all of them nuanced a certain way, really are, are demonstrated in that idea of God's free, undeserved favor. It is His many-faceted kindnesses, as someone said. So that's the Greek word. He's writing to a church. Now, it's been established for a while. There are Greeks there. There are some Hebrews there, more, many more Greeks than, than Hebrews. But the, his next word that he uses is peace, grace and peace. It's kind of an idea of of bringing unity, showing that there's, there's a diversity of people here. And he's speaking to both groups. Peace, the word shalom, the, the, the Hebrew word shalom. God's grace gives us peace. 
gives us peace with, with God. We're no condemnation now before God. And it gives us not just peace with God, but it gives us the peace of God. We have a tranquility now in our life. A peace of conscience. No anxiety about life. A tranquility, a, a wholeness. And this is what he's wishing for them. All those wonderful blessings, he says, only comes to us from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So now look, he, he speaks of his prayerful remembrance of them. Look at verses 3 through 5. Read that again. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So look at that. Paul is letting them know how he prays for them. His prayers are, are filled with thanksgiving, always offering his prayers with joy because of their fellowship with him in the gospel. And I look at that, and I'm ashamed to say that oftentimes my prayers seem more like a dry reciting of a grocery list. Father, be with this person. Father, help this person. Be with this situation and this situation. And I just kind of list them off. But Paul here, we're going to, next week, we're, we're going we're to be looking at one of his prayers. Specifically, we can learn so much from his prayers. Paul's prayer here is not just a, a dry reciting of, of, of wishes. They're filled with joy, he says, overflowing with thanksgiving. How different this letter is. How different it begins than, say, the letter to the Corinthians, where he has to remind them of his unique apostolic authority again and again and again, right? We don't see that here in the beginning. How different this is than the, the letter to the Galatians, who, where he literally is scolding them, saying, who bewitched you? You know, you, you, are, you are just, you've all but left the faith. Here it's totally different. He opens with, when I pray for you, I am full of joy. I am full of thanksgiving. It lifts my heart. And I'm sure there were awkward people, and I'm sure there were problems. We, we see there were problems. As I said later, he's going to speak about two ladies who had difficulty with one another. And his prayers for them, think about this, I'm sure were, were filled with sorrow and hope. He's going to be feeling their pain as he's bringing them before God. He's going to be experiencing that tension as, as he brings that situation to God. Do we, do we sense that when we're praying for people? I'm sure we do. When we're praying for someone, we, we know what they're going through, and we can't experience it like they can, but we're taking it before God. And we really need to do a better job of thinking about that person and not just throwing out a name and throwing, throwing a list up before God, but, but realize that the ones that we love, the ones that we care about are going through difficult things. And a, and a beautiful prayer, a real prayer, is one that is filled with emotion, filled with concern. We enter into their situation when we bring them before the Lord. And Paul says, when I, when I pray for you, Philippians, it brings a smile to my face. My spirits are lifted. He experiences, he expresses joy in these prayers. And it's really interesting when you think about it. He's, he's writing, again, remember this, from prison, awaiting trial. Execution is a very real possibility. Yet he is expressing so much joy here. Again, because he's not focused on his circumstances He's not focused on his life and what he wants to do. He's focused on Christ, and he's focused on others, isn't he? I, I find this very interesting. This letter, the Philippians, I believe, has what is the strongest words in the Bible on putting others first. Look at it with me. Uh, Philippians 2, 2 through 5. He says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. I think the, most, the strongest words we can find in the New Testament on selflessness. And yet at the same time, the same book pointing us to how to experience joy. How to rejoice even during the storms. 
when we're down because of circumstances happening in our life, we need to do what Paul did here. We need to focus on Christ. We need to focus on others. And our joy won't disappear. One of the reasons, look at it there, that he gives for his joy and thanksgiving is their fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. The NIV says their partnership in the gospel. Uh, the Phillips, because we have worked together for the gospel. That partnership began, if you remember, with Lydia, didn't it? When she showed them incredible hospitality, saying, please, stay in my home. Please, let me feed you. Let me serve you. It, it went on with, with the jailer also, immediately showing them hospitality, washing their wounds, and feeding them after he came to Christ. Well, look, at, look at 2 Corinthians. Flip over to 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. Run through some passages real quick here to see how they, how they partnered with Him. How they worked together with Him. How they fellowshiped in the gospel with Him. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. Remember, Macedonia is where Philippi was. So Philippi is not mentioned by name here. He says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Verse 5, And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God, to us. Paul took up a collection, remember, for the saints in Jerusalem. And out of their poverty, he says, the Macedonians, the Philippians gave, and they gave above their means, a wealth of generosity on their part, Paul says. And we could go through and, and look, um, if you flip back to Philippians, Philippians 4, 14 through 18, speaks there of their generosity, 4, 14 through 18. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. 2 Corinthians 11.9. We don't have to turn there, but he speaks about the Philippians there supplying his need. Philippians 1.9 speaks of their, their prayers for him. Philippians 1.27 and following a, a beautiful picture of fellowship in the gospel. Look at that, 127. He says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. They were in fellowship with him. The Greek word is koinonia. It means a sharing, a participation. And this is what Paul is saying, one of the reasons he is so thankful for them. This is what brought him so much joy, that they were part of the work. Part of the work financially, but also by giving of themselves. There was work to be done, and they didn't just say, someone else will do it. And they didn't just say, let's throw some money at it. No, they, they joined in, and they were part of it with him. They sent money by Epaphroditus. They sent Epaphroditus to take the money to serve Paul, to care for him. He calls Epaphroditus a fellow soldier, a fellow worker. James Boyce was helpful here too on this word koinonia and fellowship. He explained that British universities are different than American universities. That in Britain, the universities are organized by colleges within the university. And each each individual college has its own structure. 
its own policies, its own distinct traits. Uh, it governs its own students, each college within. And he said the professors in those individual colleges work together to conduct the affairs of, of that college, and they are called fellows. And he said, because they're men who fellowship together in the work of the college. He said, now you might see them out on the green in their, in their black robes, enjoying the day, talking about sports or talking about poetry or whatever. And he, he said, you might look at that and say they are fellowshipping together. But, but that's not the real definition of fellowship, of koinonia. Where we see that is when they work together for a common cause. The deeper meaning of fellowship. They are working together for a common cause. They're experiencing difficulties and challenges together. And they're working toward a common goal. So when we go downstairs after service and have a meal together, that's fellowship in one sense. But not in the deepest, truest sense. In the deepest and truest sense, it's when we're working together, ministering to one another and to... And to people outside, that's when we're really experiencing koinonia, a partnership. The Philippians were all in. They were to the work. And that, and that creates a, a deeper fellowship and a, and a camaraderie. I, I, we, we, uh, last year at camp, several of us said, well, one of us or two of us specifically said, it would be neat if we could do the meals next year. If with these junior high kids are, are coming in from several counties around, many of them low-income families, and uh, as I've said, we, we took homemade cookies several years ago, and they were just shocked. These are homemade cookies. And, and we thought it would be nice for us to enter in a little deeper than we have been and also feed them, supply the food. Uh, the camp will supply the money, but us organize it, us cook it, us serve it to them, us be the ones who deliver it. It'll be a, a, a great way for us to show them our love for them and, and our, our concern for them. But it'll take work. It'll take several people working together. And in that, in that work is, as I said last week or a couple weeks ago, that's, that's when the friction is going to arise. That's when there's going to become difficulties because we all have our own ideas about how things need to be done. The church is a, is a workshop, isn't it? And, and we need to be working together to, to accomplish the goals that we, we have before us. And, and this, this, is a, this is a neat opportunity for us to do that. And that will be a time of fellowship that's on a deeper level than, than what we just experienced coming and talking to one another. So if you're interested, Amanda, talk to Amanda about that. She's the one who volunteered. And we're excited about that opportunity. So Paul prayerfully thankfully, with joy, remembers the Philippians because of their fellowship in the gospel. Next, he expresses his confident expectation of them. This is a beautiful passage of Scripture. Philippians 1, verse 6, look at it. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of, Christ, of Jesus Christ. So look at that verse. Who began a good work in them? Was it Paul? Well, in one sense, we could say, yeah, Paul was the one who walked into the, to Europe for the first time. But no, he's referring to God because God is the one who began a good work in them. And what God begins, this verse tells us, God finishes. He's not one to start a project like me <laughs> and not have it finished. I walk around my farm and I'm like, oh, oh, there's just jobs everywhere, halfway done. God is not like that. He says, I'm confident of this. And it's not because they're really good people and there's not a lot of problems and you know, this, you're a pleasure to deal with and you're, you're on the right track. That's not what he's saying here. He says, I am confident of this because of who started it. Listen to a few other translations. Today's English version says, And so I am sure of this, that God, who began this good work in you, will carry it on until it is finished in the day of Christ Jesus. The NIV, He will carry it on to completion. The Phillips, He will go on developing it until the day. God is the one who began this. It's comforting. If you love the Lord Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord, and you've placed your faith in Him, that is a work that God has begun. That's not just that you finally wisened up, <laughs> finally matured. It's not that. It's that God's begun something in you. 
Later he's going to explain how God does this. But now he just wants us to know that God's the one who started it and God is the one who will finish it. The sanctification process, right? The process of, of being born again, having your soul made righteous before God because of what Christ has done. And, it's, and it only happens by faith, but then there is a sanctification process, a cleansing process. God begins to work in our lives. He transforms people into the image of Christ. That, that's the goal that we're all heading to, is, is for God to transform us into the image of Christ. And that's not an, that's not an overnight process. I read, I read somewhere that when God wants to make an oak tree, He takes 100 years. And when He wants to make a, when he wants to make a squash, He takes 60 days. <laughs> He's working on something very, very significant, our lives. And it, is a, it, it takes time. I like what one author said. He said, the beginning of the Christian experience is not the end. After a person is born again, there is still work to be done. It isn't good enough to be satisfied with the work of Christ that saves you from damnation, but lets you keep living in hell. Think about that. Having, having been made righteous ju judicially through Christ, through faith in Christ, Christ then carries on that process to make you righteous in reality. It's not going to happen until... Christ comes back or until we die and meet Him face to face and then we will be perfectly cleansed. He empowers us and He enables us to live lives that are out of this world, that are different. And it's a battle on our part. It is literally warfare on a day-to-day -day process. We don't want to say, well, this is a process and I'm in process, so I'm okay with living where I'm living right now. So that's not the point at all. That should scare us to death if we're having those, those kind of thoughts. Look at Philippians 2, 12 and 13. It shows us this, this, this battle and it shows us that God is the one who's working in us to 12 and 13. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. Flesh it out. You've been saved. You, you've been made a child of God. He says, Now work it out. Let, let its outworking be seen by those around. He says, With fear. And trembling. And look at verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He puts the will to in you, and he puts the, the doing, the ability, the working in you. This is the, the process of sanctification. Look back at verse 6 again. It speaks to the fact, look at it, that God began your transformation. He opened your eyes to his truth, just like he did to Lydia and Philippi. It also speaks to the fact that he will complete it. And it speaks to the fact that it is a process, right? We'd, we'd all like to be perfect right now, wouldn't we? <laughs> I'd like to be done with this battle with sin. I'd like to be holy and righteous right now. But God uses all sorts of things in our lives, doesn't He? He uses all sorts of difficult people and kind people and difficult situations and, and good situations, but He uses more the difficult and painful to really file away, doesn't He? And to change us. And that growth is slow. Sometimes it's an imperceivable process. We can't even see it. A boy, a young boy, was playing a piano doing a recital for three years running, going to the same stage, the same area, the same piano, a crowd of people. And for three years he did his recitals. The third year he came back and sat down next to his mom and he said, the piano was smaller this year. And she said, no, you're growing. And he hardly noticed it. Melissa mentioned that on Wednesday nights they're, they're dealing with the word perfection in, in 1 John. And the word perfection, that word to be perfect, is scary for us to, you know, God expects me to be perfect. She was explaining how, how that means. Uh, where they were studying, it was, it was, think of it in the sense of a fruit ripening to completion. I, I have a fig tree in my backyard, several fig trees, and one of them finally put out a bunch of figs. And I'm, I'm watching 50 or 60 of these figs, and none of them are ripe yet. And the way you tell with a fig 
is it comes out, the little stem comes out from the branch and the little fig's standing up, uh, you know, on the end of it there and it's at an angle like this. And when that fig ripens, it slowly begins to droop and it looks like it's about to fall off. And if you catch it right there, that, that's when it's really good. And I had one the other day and my brother came over and I went over and tried to show him, tried to find one for him. And I'm like, well, it's, it's, it's getting there, but it's not going to be as good as it could be. But that's perfection. It's a, a state of completion. And that's what we're all, we're all on here. Our daily bread had this devotional. It said, the Lord always looks at His people as they will be when they are done. It would be good for us to look at them the same way. He says, an artist conceived in his mind what he just knew would be his greatest masterpiece. He began working on a giant canvas, putting in the drabs and the grays that would be the background. And a friend walked in behind him, unnoticed, watching him as he worked. Finally, the artist noticed him, turned around and asked him, what do you think of my masterpiece? His friend laughed and he said, well, not much. <laughs> and the artist said, ah, he says, you can't see what's going to be there. And I can. God is, God is working on each one of us. The author went on to say, I think it was uh, Harry Ironside, So it is with God. He sees in every believer that which will be fully brought out at the return of Christ. And He is working now toward that end. One day, he says, every believer will be perfectly conformed to the image of God's Son. God will put the finishing touch on each one of us. And notice, not when we die, it says at the day of Christ Jesus. We, we really may not die before He returns. <laughs> he may return, and when He does, we will be perfected, or we will die as believers, and when we are standing before Him, we will be perfected, no longer dealing with sin. So Paul first expresses his prayerful remembrance, then his confident expectation, and look real quick, almost done, on his loving devotion to them. Remember last week I quoted somebody, I can't remember who, saying this letter oozes with love. It does. Look at verses 7 and 8. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul was not lacking in the area of affection, was he? He wasn't one of these men that can't express his emotions. I remember a pastor once telling me once, you can't get too close to the people you serve. He said it'll have an effect on your leadership over them. It's very offensive. <laughs> created a, a tense-filled discussion right after that. That is not what we see in Scripture. It's not what we see in Paul. He was so close to them, like a tender mother, he says in some places. It's not what we see in Christ when Christ was here. And it wasn't all about his leadership over them. He led by serving, didn't he? But think about this. Think about those words that I just read. Here, here is Paul, who was formerly called Saul. Saul was the Pharisee. Saul was attacking Christians. He was throwing them in jail. He was giving them thumbs down for execution. He was hunting them down, he says, from city to city, pursuing them. And then once he caught them, sending them off to, to prison. And now here he is saying, I have you in my heart. You're always in my heart. Listen to it in the Phillips translation. It is only natural that I should feel like this about you all. You are very dear to me. For during the time I was in prison, as well as when I was defending and proving the authority of the gospel, we shared together in the grace of God. God knows how much I long with the deep love and affection of Christ Jesus for your companionship. I read that and I thought, what a transformation. What a change. God really did a work on Paul, didn't He? totally changed him. It makes me think, and, and turn with me, we'll, we'll end with this. First Timothy, it makes me think of this. And this is what, what we see as we uh, look down through here is life change happening in all of these people. First Timothy 1, 15 and 16. This is where, this is where Paul says, 
that He is the foremost of sinners. I, I love this passage. I've shared it several times, but I think it's been years since I have. 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, Paul says there, "...the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason." that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display His perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. Look at the word example there in verse 16. The word literally means a, a sketch. I, I love the way Gordon Fee explains this. He says, In His gallery of grace... The artist Savior, as it were, has drawn and put on display an exhibition, a sketch, as an illustration, a pattern, a model of the type of work sovereign grace was going to perform in the lives of all those who through its efficacy would come to rest their faith on Christ. He says the, the artist Savior has, has done a sketch. Here, here's what sovereign grace is going to do in the lives of people, and that's Paul. Paul says, me as the foremost of sinners, God has shown His ability, His power to totally transform lives. God changes people. He gives them eternal life. He changes their destiny. But He also changes them for good. He brings them into His service, His fellowship. And He starts, He, he finishes what He started. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Thank You that as we look on the page, we can believe and understand and know that this has been faithfully transmitted down to us, that it is truth, it is Your truth, and it applies perfectly to our lives. I pray for each one of us, Father, that as we move through this letter, we'll, we'll see that power to change lives that, that is demonstrated here in the lives of these people. Pray, Father, that you'll help us all understand that to, to experience a life of joy and rejoicing, we are to lay our lives before you and offer them before you. That we are to become your slaves. There's no more beautiful service in the world than to be a slave of yours. To turn our, our goals and our aspirations in and to receive yours in that place. We thank You, Father, that You have done this, that You have desired to work through Your people and that we can experience all of the joy, all of the difficulties that come with that, but we experience it with You. We thank You for Your love for us, Father, and I pray for each one of us here that, that we'll not let another day go by if we have not expressed faith in You, but that we will reach out for the gift that You've given us of salvation through Jesus Christ. We thank You for what He's done for us, coming and living the perfect life in our place and then dying on the cross with our sins on His back so that we could be made right with You. Thank You, Father, for such a wonderful salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.